Well, it's great to be here. When actually, um, I spend a lot of time here. Actually, my spouse grew up here, which is great. So thank you for the community to help making her. She's awesome. And then I actually have my in-laws here today. So I have asked for you that you'd be really engaged in this and do me a solid and just look like this is the best presentation you've ever been here. Now, they actually have served the community in different capacities. So my father-in-law was a radiologist in the community, served the community in a healthcare capacity. And my mother-in-law, librarian, elementary teacher. So a long history in this valley of, of helping people be well. And there's the presentation. It went. Well, talk amongst yourselves while I log back in. You got a little bit about Excelsior, but we have roots in the foster care system. That's where we started. And what we learned there is that if you provide respect, you provide hope, and you care for people, it really doesn't matter necessarily what the program is. If you have those roots, you can deliver pretty high quality care and you can do what's best for the community. Now we offer a network of subsidiaries, and through those subsidiaries, we serve about 5,000 people in the Spokane and across the region. We have a couple different virtual specialty programs, and we've integrated virtual care throughout our continuum from family medicine to our behavioral health programs. But first, let me tell you a story. So it's early on in the pandemic, it's like the summer, maybe 2020, and I'm here in Wenatchee and we, our family had just done a camping trip and I have a really important call and I have one call for the day. So I, obviously I did not want to go back to work. I wanted to paddleboard more than work. So I loaded up my iPhone in a Ziploc baggie at my in-laws house and I have my headphones in the Ziploc bag and I head out. Everyone in the house is like, this is a terrible idea, but I'm going to, I'm going to, Paddleboard over to the, if you watch these, you know, if you go over there, there's like the uh, gravel beaches or the sand beaches. That's where I'm going to go have this very important meeting. We're going to launch a center of excellence in foster care. So I get on my paddleboard. Well, the Columbia, if you haven't been on it, it's a big, fast river. I'm not going anywhere. So I have to log on to the call, like on my paddleboard. And I check in, I do my, my name, my pronouns, where I'm from. And i um, I keep it unmuted because I'm like, I'm not going to make it, but I'm still on this call pretending. Well, I fall in. I fall in the river and someone going, turn off. Is someone by the dryer, the washing machine? Turn it off as the river's just rushing my paddles floating down the river. And I'm like getting back into it. I climb back on the paddle board and I'm like, I have to tell these people what I'm doing. So I confess. Now, what does that have to do with telehealth? Not that much. I just wanted to tell the story because I'm Wenatchee and it's a pretty good story. <laughs> but you know, it was the early time, you know, you didn't have to be on camera in the pandemic and this will relate a little bit. You know, those early days where we didn't have like the virtual things and it was rapidly evolving. So you didn't have to be on camera. That wasn't weird at that time. So it worked. What I wanted to do at the 3.30 presentation, I think you've got a great amount of data in earlier presentations. You've sort of bought into the vision of telehealth. You're all here. Some of you are in different stages of designing those programs. So I'd like us to back out a bit and think a little bit about, little bit about telehealth history. I'll share a little bit about Excelsior's technology journey, which is ironic that I'm here talking about technology if you were to get in the time machine 10 years ago. And then some practical things that we think about when we're implementing programs some of that's been built off of that COVID learning, which was such a rapid learning environment. We all had to change really fast. And if you're lucky, you captured some of that learning for future projects. Da -da. Next slide is working. Ah, there we go. So, we go back in the, the time machine, 1906, this guy is a Nobel Prize winner and his name is Willem, Wilhelm something or other. But what he did is a Nobel, he, Willem Eishoffen, I think. And he invented the, or was one of the early inventors of the electrocardiograph. And he did an experiment 
and it was a one mile um, telephonic transcription of whatever device he needed, whatever the transcription. 1906, this was happening. Fast forward, I was laughing. So this is in 1925, and it's from the Scientific and Invention magazine, and this is Hugo Gernsbeck, and he was not a physician, but a technologist, an, an editor, sort of envisioned telephonic care, and I was laughing. We were joking, or the, the noon presenter was talking about remote colonoscopy. I don't think that's what that machine is. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> But it's pretty weird what he's talking, like the doctor, and I've got a quote from him, the doctor is remote handling this robot. I don't want to come up with the policies and procedures in order to get that to work. Here's a little bit more how that was transmitted, or the idea of it. Now, you're not supposed to put this many words in a PowerPoint, but there's some things I do in presentations you're not supposed to do, and we're doing it. I want to kind of read this together. As our civilization progresses, we find it more and more necessary to act at a distance. Instead of visiting our friends, we now telephone them. This, however, is far from sufficient. As we progress, we find our duties are multiplied, and we have less and less to transport our physical bodies in order to transact business, to amuse ourselves, and so on. This is 1925. We're talking about the telephone. Not FaceTime, not Snapchat, not Instagram. The busy doctor, 50 years hence, so this would be 1975, will not be able to visit his patients as he does now. It takes too much time. And he can only at best see a limited number today. Whereas the services of a really big doctor are so important that he should never have to leave his office. On the other hand, his patients cannot always come to him. This is where teledactyl and diagnosis, diagnosis by radio comes in. Now, teledactyls, tele from afar, dactyl finger, kind of weird, but that, so this is it. Now, if we pause just really quickly, I think it's important to bring a little bit of awareness from DEI. Hopefully we're all committed as leaders in our organizations to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And one of the things I noticed when I read this was the doctor is he, and how much that's ingrained within our, our consciousness, within our psyche, and our mental models of how healthcare works. You also see a very hierarchical position within that, the very big doctor, right? So it's just important to know, not necessarily criticism, I'm just pointing it out. Now we're back onto your regular scheduled programming on television, which isn't a thing anymore. The same dynamics that this person envisioned, Hugo, are what we're trying to solve today. People are busier, they can't get to their appointments, doctors are busy, workloads are more complex, we're not able to get the care we need in the physical location, so what's an alternative? And this is, in 1925, this person envisioned it. Now, since I'm not here to do data like The Economist, Let's raise a hand. Who went to virtual care prior to COVID? Right? Don't tell me what you did. You raise your hand, yeah. How many people after COVID? Yeah, so my little stats, a handful and a lot, right? So in 1925, we, 1906, we, we have this envisioning and people have some technology, we have some cool stuff, and then nobody uses it. Right? And that would be funny. I wish we could invite these two people here and we'd be like, you can have something in your pocket, in your phone, and you can get your doctor in here, and then we can also have at your room, we can have a, this thing that's going to measure your blood pressure, and they're going to have all your stats. It's so cool. They'd be like, what? This is amazing. So you can be in Idaho. Well, you actually can't be in Idaho. <laughs> that's, no, that you can't, you're not going to get billed for that. Okay, fine. So the patient can be an item. Well, no, technically no, because are they licensed in there? To, oh. So we have all this capacity to do amazing things with our technology, and we're still in a very antiquated healthcare system with our capabilities. They're just a bold statement, so do with that what you want. And then, bam. 
COVID hits. Now, we're not trying to get into can of worm about what you think about the state mandate, but all of a sudden we were forced on a dime to change our system. Now that just wasn't healthcare, but it really had implications for healthcare. I remember um, sitting in my basement. I, made a tr I put my treadmill under a desk because it's a pretty stressful time. You gotta walk off those stress calories you're getting, you know? So I'm on my desk and I'm just thinking, how are we gonna code this new thing? And I actually fell off my treadmill and hit the wall. Another story that's not relevant, just a pretty good story. But we were all working really hard to transition our models of care on a dime. So I thought those are some lessons that we could maybe learn from. So you see this growth of telehealth, it's just cruising along, no one's really using it. Spike, we're all using it. And now it's settled into a place where maybe we start to see the use cases, we're getting much more data, we have health economists are saying, here's where it's really applicable, here's where it's saving money, and it's sort of stabilized. Interestingly enough, if you had invested in this company, it sort of follows the same curve. I'm not gonna tell you which company this is. We don't need to get on and start trading stocks if that's what you're here to do. But this is actually a telehealth company that's traded on, um, you know, traded in Wall Street that follows the same curve. There's a really big um, economic uh, incentive now for telehealth because people had that rapid adoption. So what are the elements of successful rapid implementation when we're talking about telehealth. So these are the things that I learned and I think they're, they can transition into the future. And dramatic pause to get water. Techno, technology infrastructure. When I started at Excelsior, I started working in group care, working with foster kids. And then I became a therapist, that's my background, uh, licensed mental therapist. And we then started growing pretty exponentially in the outpatient space. And we bought 10 laptops, pretty great. No EHR. I actually put the first EHR on my personal credit card because I'm like, we can do this. And I coded the first EHR. I have no business doing any such activities, right? We're a community behavioral health provider. We had no margin, or so we thought, in to invest in technology infrastructure. The, the Affordable Care Act comes. We have ACHs in our community with, at least in Spokane, I'm sure it was here as well, had an investment in providers to get their EHRs and their technology infrastructure to a cable place. Not for seeing a pandemic or this transition to telehealth, but saying, hey, we, you gotta get up to speed. We actually put five different providers, we negotiated a rate, put five different providers on the same EHR. What that did was provided a technological infrastructure in place for us to rapidly implement. It was a really effective model, especially during the time of COVID when people were stressed, <laughs> and strapped in and we had to change things fast. We could do it for five different providers all at once. We also had made strategic investments in our ITIS infrastructure. It used to be, no offense, Scott, Scott, just a guy named Scott. He has a last name, he's great. But he didn't have a background in computers. He ran all our computers. Five years or so before COVID, we started investing in real professionals who are able to deliver high quality ITIS service. Without that, if you try to change programs quickly or you try to get in new spaces, it's gonna be hard. Regulatory adaptability. Do people remember those emails that you were getting like on a daily basis? It's gonna be this, it might be that, it might be that. You kind of had to just trust. Actually, that's a different point on the PowerPoint. Forget I said that. You had to, there was a regulatory adaptability, a suspension of what you th what was the current status quo in order to innovate and you could just say okay this is probably going to be accepted use of our health care delivery because of this pandemic so let's innovate 
Those were kind of fun and scary. You had to have a certain capital to invest. If you want to be a resilient organization, you have to have reserves because we're pivoting. Not only because this crazy pandemic that we all live through, but if we're all be, gonna be influenced by technology, technology can change fast. There's more disruptors in the market. Things can move pretty quickly. So we're going to have to, as community behavioral health providers, oh, that's ahead in the slides, but invest some of our capital in order to be creative and innovative in the space. We also had to suspend the financial realities. The dirty secret of healthcare, we, we really, you know, good people all throughout it, but we do what we're paid for. Whoops, <laughs> we do, all right? Now, sometimes we say we get a wild hair and we develop a program with the thinking we're gonna get paid for, we're gonna have the option, but we, we do what we're reimbursed for. We're participatory in that system. It's not just the payers who are out there. Healthcare providers design their systems too often for the current reimbursement models. I was struck with this during the pandemic as well. Counseling, should counseling be 50 minutes? Uh, maybe there's some evidence base for that, but just that's what the billing code is. It's like increments of 15 minutes. So everyone schedules. Now, I'm not saying that that's why counselors do it, but it's curious, right? Well, during the pandemic, I, had all the, I wasn't practicing a lot. I had these teenagers who I used to see, they reached out and say, scared, I'm anxious, can you meet with me? Well, I would meet with them 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 22 minutes. I didn't really care about the reimbursement model because I had flexibility. It was just a small thing of what I was doing every day. We were using text messages. We were really flexible. Now I understand that's really hard to scale. I'm not saying that's how we have to design our system because we all need to get reimbursed. But there was this time where we had to develop for the purpose or without really knowing what the financial realities were because we had to serve our people. We had to serve them well in a really chaotic time. It's kind of like watching uh, what's when you're watching nonfiction movies, you have to suspend your disbelief. It was kind of that way. And we had to have trust that policy and regulations were going to develop or you just freeze and you'd stop and you wouldn't do much. You had to trust that we were gonna virtualize things that needed to be virtualized. We were gonna come up with some conditional regulatory framework to get the job done. And in large part, those regulations shifted to what we need to do. And now we're all here, or not yet all here, but some people are really focused on making those permanent and adjusting them, and toggling them to be what they really need to be for that future. some opportunities to improve. The things we notice were historical dominance of the fee-for-service system. Not just in the way that we're reimbursed, but the fundamental way that healthcare is designed to be delivered. I do the widget, I get paid to do the thing, regardless of whether the outcome is, and that's what I do, and then I divine, design my workflow to maximize that reimbursement model, and that's just the way it is. You know, we all operate in that system to some degree. And we didn't change that much. You know, it, when you're in a telehealth environment, and we'll get a little bit more into that, we tend to shove that same experience into a fee-for-service paradigm, even though we might not be operating in that if we have some alternative payment models established, we have a value-based agreement, we are capitated, whatever it Maybe we still tend to operate in that fee-for-service workflow. Our computer systems are designed that way. It works, it's a lot easier to develop. It's just the way that the system was worked. Our claims management system is oriented around that model, that historical model. We have some prevailing constraints. The past was constrained by medium bound limitations. Now, what the heck does that mean? Um, yeah, what does that mean? I should know. No. <laughs> um, Marshall McLuhan came up with the medium as the message. And what that means is the, the technology, the actual medium, the thing that you're using in itself has content, right? It's not just that we're doing video, 
conferencing. That video has an influence